Here's a development in income tax that will prompt your memory. Go back to about your third lecture ever in income tax, capital gains and property transactions. Remember how we used to bore our examiners with quoting from the famous Rubicon speech of Natal Estates and all that stuff? Now we get a new case, again a judgment of Lewis J.A. in the case of CSARS versus Forest Hill Proprietary Limited. And it looks at this whole question of disposal of property in property development and the whole idea of a realization company. Does it work or doesn't it? Watch this. Okay, what's it all about? We've got ACI out on the northeast of Johannesburg with a dynamite factory with lots of extra land lying around it from the days when men were men and dynamite was dangerous. Now what they are wanting to do is to sell off the land to third parties. Now, if it was just a sale of land, we would take the old principles established in cases such as Commission of Taxes versus Boyson's Estate, where NSCJ in 1918 spoke of realizing an asset to a best advantage, gives, gives a capital receipt versus carrying on business of trading, gives you a revenue gain. And we could also throw in here cases like Boyson's Estate, 1928, where Sir John Vessel said every person is entitled to realize such an asset to best advantage. The fact that they are selling cannot alter what is an investment of capital into a trade or business for earning profits. So if it had been a straight sale of, of property, there would have been no problem. But the predicament is that if you put in developers into your land, then you hopefully will get a lot more for it. Nobody wants to buy plots without any services, roads, etc. But the moment that we start doing that, we start running into the area of the Natal Estates case, where we risk going beyond realization to best advantage and risk crossing the Rubicon where our land, which was formerly a ca capital asset, becomes our stock in trade. That's the predicament. The solution that AEC I found was in the realization company case of Berea West Estates. And what Berea West Estates settles is we take the company, we now form a subsidiary we call that Founders Hill, and that is your realization company. It's a wholly owned subsidiary. We then take the land and we transfer the land into the realization company. Then we are put in our own money and skills as developers, and we bring outside developers in as well. And the subsidiary sells off the land to the third-party buyers. And what they were hoping here was that it would be accepted that the Berea West principle applies and that that will protect the capital gain because we're doing nothing but realizing off an asset to best advantage. Well, the Income Tax Special Court in Johannesburg agreed with the taxpayer. So it was taken on appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal. Judgment was given by Lewis J.A. on 10 May 2011. 5-0 judgment against the taxpayer in favor of SARS. So, what is that, what's the fundamental change? Well, Lewis comes back and said, look, the Income Tax Special Court, SARS and the taxpayer, has got this thing completely wrong. It's not a question of whether we've gone straight off and crossed the Rubicon. There's an inquiry that comes f before that. It was incorrect to assume that the, the assets were capital assets of Founders Hill in the first place. The SCA found that the assets were stock in trade from the start. So what we've got here is that, yes, Berea West cap gives a capital receipt. But if one goes back on the Berea West case, one finds that there were huge numbers of issues and errors and realization over a long period of time, the facts in that case were fundamentally different from the Founders Hill judgment. In Founders Hill, there was only one shareholder, and that was a wholly owned subsidiary of AECI. Lewis J.A. went about it by saying, but approaching the matter in that way begs the question whether the property was a capital asset in the hands of Founders Hill in the first place. said it always was trading stock. 
it is thus clear that there are two steps. The first step is to determine whether an asset has been owned by a realization company, but is it a capital asset or stock in trade from the start? Only once we've concluded that it's a capital asset can you then go to the second step and apply the Natal Estates case and say, have you then gone too far in your process of realization and taken the stock over into stock in trade? There are thus two hurdles to cross, and wh what happened in the underlying courts, in the Income Tax Special Court, was that they never considered the first hurdle. So, what AECI did wrong here was to think that by forming the realization company, that they had, as some people have put it, a Harry Potter magic wand that would automatically make the profits capital in the realization company. That was an incredible assumption that went against them. And what you've got to realize is that if you're going to use a realization company only in special circumstances, will the proceeds be on capital account? What we've got to do is go back to fundamentals here. Go to Section 1 in the Act, Definition of Trading Stock, and it says, Part A1, anything produced, manufactured, constructed, assembled, purchased, or in any other manner acquired by the taxpayer for purpose of manufacture, sale, or exchange by the taxpayer or on behalf of the taxpayer. What else could that land have been in the hands of Forest Hill? Really, what's gone wrong here? Right from the start, they had the fundamental assumptions wrong. What they should have said is, right, owner forms realization company. Then you take the land and you transfer the land into the realization company. And the proceeds from the sale of that land into the realization company in the hands of the original owner is a capital gain. And that's fine. That has not been disturbed. Then the realization company continues and it brings in its developers and it throws in its money and it on sells to the third party at the end of the day. But the realization company in that case has got to say, I've sold trading stock here, so the proceeds from the sale will be revenue in nature. It is wrong to automatically assume that the realization company will receive capital income. That would only be in the most exceptional circumstances. So, what we do in practice is that we increase the capital gain as far as we can possibly justify it, and we try to break the realization company even so that it does not pay a huge amount more tax. One must also note that these cases that we've been discussing are very old cases. In the old days, the price was completely different. The capital gain to the original owner would have been taxed 0%, and the revenue gain would probably have given rise to an exposure of 40%. Today, we are looking at a far smaller arbitrage, where the owner receiving a capital gain will only be taxed at 14%, whereas the realization company would be taxed at 28%. The stakes are completely different. Some say that Lewis J.A. took things too far, and she should have left matters as they were. And they also say that the new judgment contradicts earlier findings in things like the pick-and-pay employee trust case. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think Lewis J.A. has got it absolutely right in this case. We are looking at the disposal of trading stock. And that will always be a gain that is revenue in nature.